Welcome to the first ever virtual reception of the EVM initiative. I'm Aki Fujimura, founder and CEO of D2S Inc. D2S is the managing company sponsor of the EVM initiative. You know, this mask industry is doing well, but so is our mask industry. These would be called more like pedicles in our industry, I think. This year, we welcome TASMIT to the EVM initiative. TASMIT is a subsidiary company of Torway Engineering, and it was uh, established in December of 2019 as the integrated company of the optical semiconductor wafer inspection systems business of Torway and the electron beam semiconductor wafer pattern verification system business of NGR. Today, we have a really exciting uh, lineup for you. Um, Jan Willis of EBIM Initiative will first present the luminary survey results, and then we will have a panel discussion uh, that discusses the luminary survey results and also the results of the mask maker survey results. Uh, it will be presented on Thursday in the program, but the video for it is already available from uh, spy.org. Um, the panelists this year are Hayas Sun of DMP, Jed Rankin of Global Foundries, and Emily Gallagher of IMAC. So let's get going. Uh, Jan, luminary survey results. I, I think it's going to be really exciting. I can't wait. Greetings from my office to yours this year. I'm Jan Willis, co-founder of the Evening Initiative. Like many of you, we'd probably rather be in Monterey but I'm sure thankful for all the technology our industry helps contribute to to bring an event like this to you online. So with that, I'd like to share with you our ninth annual survey results of the luminaries. I want to start by saying thank you to the 77 luminaries who participated in the survey in July of this year. They represented 42 different companies. And like in the past, about two thirds represent either the mask or equipment segment as shown in the pie chart in green and purple. Now, unlike last year, we've changed many of the questions. And that's because EUV and multi beam have definitely graduated beyond the when and if questions. But similarly, the questions re represent opinions of individuals. And we believe that with luminaries participating, it increases the credibility of the results. Like in the past, I'm your reporter, so I will be reporting the results, but not trying to interpret be beyond some of the key insights that we see. I'll leave that up to you at home and to the panel that's going to follow this discussion. We will also post the survey um, slides as well as the video on eating.org after the event. So now let me just give you the, the, the highlights first, and then we'll dive into all the, the questions that were asked. First, the luminaries are predicting that COVID-19 will have a net neutral impact on mass market revenues by 2021. They're also predicting that EV will have a positive impact on the mass market size as well as driving equipment purchases. And finally, that curvilinear mass shapes will be pervasive by the year 2023. So with that, let's take a look at the detailed questions. So in the first result, um, the survey says net neutral COVID-19 business impact. And how we get there is that we, we ask the question, what would be the impact of COVID-19 in 2020 on the left and 2021 on the right. The uh, uh, neutral is shown in blue and a positive impact of COVID-19 is shown in green and negative is shown in red. And you can see on the left that um, the majority um, or 76% is a neutral to positive with 24% negative. But in 2021, that changed with the negative going down to 20% and the positive increasing to 24%, outweighing uh, the negative impact and therefore creating a net neutral impact by 2021. Now let's look at what the survey said about the impact um, 
overall on the mass market for 2020. And what we see is that 89% predict that it's positive or neutral uh, in terms of growth over 2019, despite COVID-19. And in particular, 33% shown in the green say that the mass market revenues will increase this year. Now, one hypothesis that Hayashi-san from DNP raised last year in the panel was that EUV would have a positive um, impact on the size of the mass market. So we asked that question this year, and the result is that 66% said that EUV would have a positive contribution to the total size of the 2020 mass market revenues. Staying on the topic of EUV, we wanted to ask about pellicles again. We changed the question slightly, and what we found is that the luminaries are saying 55% that EUV will have pellicles in use in high volume manufacturing by 2022. But 45% are still saying that they either can't predict when or that it would be 2023 or beyond. So I think the results are somewhat inconclusive and perhaps this is a question that the panel can later shed some light on. We also wanted to check in on perceptions about um, EUV mask inspection. So we changed it this year and we asked for agreement or disagreement to three statements. And in the first one at the top, you'll see that 74% agreed to the statement that actinic inspection will be used in the mask shop for EUV high volume by 2023. In the second question below it, we found that 48% agreed with the statement that e-beam multi-beam inspection will be used in the mass shop for EUV high volume by 2023. Now going into the survey, we anticipated that um, participants would agree with one or the other statement, but with the total coming in at 122% of agreement, we're not sure what the uh, the reason is for that. So again, that may be a topic for the panel to discuss. And then at the bottom, we had a third statement where we found that 51% agreed with the statement e-beam multi-beam inspection of wafers will be used for the purpose of mass inspection for EUV high volume by 2023. Now, EUV also came out as one of the top reasons for multi-beam mass rider purchases. So in a new question, we gave um, participants six reasons to rank on what would be the primary reason for driving or for purchasing mass, um, multi-beam mass riders. And what you're seeing is by each reason, you're seeing the plot of the responses with the percentage of either first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth place votes shown in the plot along with the NA answer um, below it. And coming in first was more throughput for EUV mass. The second highest reason was more precision required for EUV mass. And in a virtual tie, curvilinear ILT for either 193 or EUV. And then in fifth place, more precision for 193 leading edge mass. And finally, in sixth place, more throughput for 193 I mass. Now, still staying on the, the mask writer topic, we ask a slightly different question this year. Um, we ask the participants to predict what will happen to purchases of uh, new mask writers by each type over the next three years. By far the most conclusive result was 96% shown on the right believe that multi-beam mask writer purchases will increase over the next three years. On the far left, you see that 32% predict that laser mass rider purchases will increase. And then in the two middle plots, you see that on the, the, the left one for trailing edge VSV, that 24% predict it will increase, but more than that, 40% believe that it will decrease. On advanced VSV mass riders next to it, we see the equal amount of 27% believe it will increase and 27% believe it will decrease. 
In a repeat question from last year, we wanted to find out how many believe or how many think um, ILT is in use for production ships today. And 84% said today that a few or more critical layers are using ILT. And that compared in gold to the uh, blue, the dark blue of last year, where 88% answered the same way. And then three years ago, and the first time we asked the question in 2017, shown in purple, that was 70% who believe ILT was in use today. So definitely has increased. Now we asked some new questions about the use of curvilinear shapes. We wanted to find out both um, separately for 193i and for EUV, but we asked the same question. And so what you're seeing on the left-hand pie chart is for 193i, and the result is that 94% believe that um, some curvilinear shapes will be used. And that is um, the result that comes from 12% shown in blue saying the entire reticle would be curvilinear shapes to 20% showed in the, the gold saying it would be a hybrid of mostly curvilinear shapes with some Manhattan, to green, which was the answer of a hybrid of mostly Manhattan shapes with some curvilinear shapes. So for EUV in the pie chart on the right, the result was 85% of EUV, EUV mass will have some curvilinear shapes. In a question that we modified but wanted to ask again this year, we found that the participants said 73% um, would predict longer EUV turnaround times by the year 2023 versus the turnaround time of 193i today. This result is in, aligns well with also the, uh, the result earlier that the number one reason for purchasing multi-beam mass riders is EUV throughput. And we returned to a new topic we introduced last year, but we changed the question. We only asked one question um, to give us a sense of when will capabilities based on deep learning become a competitive advantage for any step in the mass making process. And the result is that 62% predict deep learning will be a competitive advantage by 2022. And notably, only 3% predicted that it would never be a competitive advantage. So with that, the summary is a very upbeat mass market outlook for 2020 and 2021, despite COVID-19. In fact, 89% predicted mass market revenues to stay the same or increase this year. Another big conclusion is that EV will be driving um, mass market revenue growth as well as equipment growth in the, in the multi-beam mass rider segment. And an overwhelming 96% predicting multi-beam mass market purchases to increase over the next three years. And finally, that the, the shape of mass will change with curvilinear shapes on mass to be pervasive by 2023 for 193i as well as EUV. So with that, let me thank again the 77 luminaries who participated in this survey. I look forward to the discussion of some of the questions that the survey raised with the panel as well as um, uh, they'll be looking at the mass with the survey as well. So I predict that uh, we'll be seeing each other in Monterey next year. Um, but for now, thank you very much for, uh, for tuning in and uh, Stay safe. Hello, uh, 2020 E-Beam Initiative Luminaries panel. We have the luminaries of the luminaries with uh, Hayashi Nawaya-san from DMP, Judd from Global Foundries, and Emily Gallagher from IMAC. The entire Northern Hemisphere is represented. <laughs> so um, yeah, let's get started, OK? Um, We'll move to the first slide. So uh, we're going to start uh, by noticing that uh, we're definitely in COVID time. Uh, you see us in the uh, Zoom video here. Um, the, uh, we did a survey question of, uh, in the luminary survey about that. And uh, it seems like uh, 
people are not as positive in 2020, but uh, uh, much more positive about 2021. This is question is asking about the impact of COVID on the mask industry. Uh, uh, what uh, do you think this is saying? Uh, uh, what, what, what's your opinion, Judd? Well, I think uh, 21, 2021 data where it's positive really sort of speaks to the fact that, right, the semi semiconductor industry is sort of the backbone of the modern world. We sort of represent and make the tools that are used to sort of fix almost any problem now. So I think there's a couple things uh, that, are, that are going into this positivity. First is it's sort of exactly what we're doing right now. Um, the remote work, uh, Zoom calls, um, working from home, all the things that are needed to support that, new computers, new laptops for not only work, but for school, but then also the backbone of the internet and the extra bandwidth that's necessary. We're seeing a sort of a lot of positive growth around that. I think the other reason that people are, uh, are uh, positive about this is that there's the potential for other ways for our industry to help the, the world through COVID. And that's in terms of medical devices, anywhere from thermometers to testing equipment, uh, and other things like my, my smartwatch now that tells me if I'm running a fever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think it's like seven nanometer, uh, 20 nanometer, like Internet of Things, uh, all of these nodes are affected, do you think, positively? I think that uh, they all are for the different applications, obviously, for a lot of the devices. Um, uh, that are more computationally intensive, including backbone technology, as well as laptops that's hitting the more advanced nodes. But then we get more into the IoT, uh, as well as the support technologies for things like um, tablets, portable devices, uh, and things uh, like thermometers and other devices like that. So I think it's hitting pretty positively across the board and across the, uh, across the portfolios. Mm, yeah. So obviously, new designs uh, take a while to impact the mask industry. So might be the 21. What What do you think about the 2020 number, Hayasan? Yeah, yeah. In the 2020, yeah. Actually, we have uh, some difficulties by the COVID-19. So one of them is uh, uh, mask delivery because of uh, less flight, especially for the international flight is quite uh, small numbers and also the cost is up. And the other thing is uh, uh, tape out delay because of uh, device designer at the remote work at the home with uh, less computational you know, powers kind of things. But it's not a canceled one, it's just a delay. So mm -hmm. I think the total 2020, the people say it's a uh, neutral, I agree about that. And also uh, it's a very positive sign for 2021. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So we did also in the luminary survey ask about the uh, uh, net of all effects, including COVID, and what would happen to the mass revenues. Uh, we have asked similar questions in the past, and, and uh, uh, it uh, had been pretty positive. Uh, this one seems pretty okay, too. Um, Emily, any uh, reactions to this one? Yeah, I mean, I, I just agree with everything that was said, and I also think that if people want to talk about more effects of COVID, there is the panel discussion that's also being held in the conference that people can listen to. But I think this reflects the same trends that Jed and Hayashi-san were just talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stephen uh, Renwick is running the panel. Uh, that's tomorrow night. It's live, so you have to wait until uh, Wednesday night to see it. But uh, yeah, I'm personally looking forward to that too. Yeah. Okay, so let's um, move on from COVID as quickly as we can. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, let's uh, go to this slide. Uh, uh, this slide is actually talking about multi-beam. We want to talk about EUV2 because that's an exciting new development. Uh, both of these are really exciting new developments. Uh, um, multi-beam first though. So uh, uh, we uh, asked about uh, what people think are the reasons to move to multi-beam. And uh, we specifically asked about six possibilities and, and asked them to rank which one is uh, is the is the biggest reason and uh, uh, it's uh, looking like EUV is the number one reason and uh, 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 what do you uh, what, what do you think what do you make of this yeah so at, uh, yeah of course uh, multi beam mask writer is uh, essential for the EUV mask with a uh, beta throughput for uh, especially for such kind of the very complex and uh, high density data masks but also uh, this tool has uh, uh, several potential. 
uh, with, uh, you know, uh, we can use uh, low sensitive lenses, which will make a better resolution. And also a very smooth air bearing system will make a very improved pattern position accuracy and overlay kind of things. So that actually uh, DNP installed uh, this tool in uh, 2016. And uh, firstly, we applied uh, this system to the non imprint template uh, because of uh, uh, it will have a uh, uh, small number of the features. Uh, it's close to the 10 nanometer kind of things. Then uh, recently, uh, we applied this tool for EUV mask process uh, for five nanometer node kind of things. And uh, also we found uh, this uh, uh, kind of a multi-pass writing mode and uh, small pixel size will make a very smooth line with roughness and the pattern fidelity. So I agree that the people said the curvilinear feature is uh, uh, suitable for this kind of the tool. So uh, that's all uh, I think about uh, this uh, result. Yeah, great, thank you. Hey, oh, well, Jen, yeah. I guess I'd say I, th I see something else here in these questions and sort of behind the questions uh, from other discussions. I think most multi-beam tools are being bought for EUV, but they're being justified and used for other applications as well. Ayashi-san mentioned some in terms of nano imprint, getting exceptionally smooth lines for LER. But I think one of the things that's uh, attractive about the modern multi-beam systems is the flexibility with the different uh, pixel sizes, different speed operations, that they're able to sort of fill a manufacturing gap um, as there's demand flexibility, since they can support between five nanometer and 40 nanometer designs with uh, with relatively minor applications. So again, I think EUV is, is the initial justification, but there's a lot of other components that go into uh, the value proposition to the modern multi-beam writers. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Hey, so uh, 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 as I mentioned, for nano imprint, you have to uh, print things in a 10 nanometer range, um, which is amazing. But um, what, what's happening on the masks? Uh, like EUV mask, uh, if you have SRAFs, um, like, like how big are those? Like 30 nanometer, something like that? Or what, what, what's happening? Uh, anybody? Uh, Emily? Yeah. So for that one, I mean, I can say just because the, the big application space for assist features requires um, flexibility on placement in order to minimize the mass 3D effects for EV. And for that, you really need a lot of flexibility in terms of the mass rules. And I don't see any other way of reducing some of the mass rule limits than going to something like multi beam mask writer and getting to feature sizes on the order, you know, sub 30 nanometers. I would really say more like 28, 24. Those are the numbers I'm being asked for very very small features because otherwise you run into printability at the at the types of pitches that are interesting for future ev yeah pretty demanding huh yeah we'll come to uh uh turnaround time question much much later <laughs> discussion but uh it's got to have an impact on that too all right well it's good you know full of challenges that's a lot of opportunities so that's a good thing oh yeah jen go ahead sorry i, I I was just going to say, I know there's a sort of a lot of questions about uh, around SRAF with the significant uh, improvement in wavelength or SRAFs needed. Uh, and I think that uh, sort of one thing about it is SRAFs will be used when they can be. Um, when, when, no, sorry, not when they can be, when they can be reliably produced. And I think that's sort of another strength of the multi-beam writer, going back to Hayashi-san, the one said, the low sensitivity resist, we can get to the good resolution. Uh, so I, I think that that's an important factor to consider too, that there may be an enablement component relative to the multi-beams. Yeah, and another thing, sorry, hidden behind what Jed's saying is what has been hugely helpful is retargeting for some of the EV applications. So I think in addition to being able to reliably produce the small SRAFs, they actually have to show a demonstrated advantage over other techniques. So I think that's the balance the industry is going to have to play with. Oh, great. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay. All right. Thanks. So um, uh, moving on more into the multi-beam stuff. So uh, this slide uh, uh, comes from uh, the mask maker survey. Um, mask maker survey uh, uh, slides on the video are available uh, to be viewed, uh, but uh, the presentation is actually on Thursday morning. Um, the uh, uh, multi-beam uh, 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 
number of multi-V masks uh, as a percentage of overall mask reported is very, very small still. Um, you know, EUV as a percentage of all masks is also very small. Um, but uh, we all know that it's going to happen. Both of these things are going to happen. Um, as an indication, uh, you can see on the right that uh, masks written by multi-beam as a percentage has uh, increased uh, more than 2x, less than 3x uh, from 2019 to 2020. So it's definitely, uh, uh, you know, we're starting to see uh, that in statistics. And then um, uh, another question on the mask maker survey asked about uh, uh, average mask writing times. And this year for the first time, uh, because uh, we need to have uh, more than three, but more than or equal to uh, three participants uh, respond in order for us to be able to report uh, uh, to protect the anonymity uh, of the input. So um, uh, this is the first time that we can report this. So we don't have a year to year comparison, but 12 hours was roughly the time uh, that the multi-beam uh, machines were uh, taking uh, to write the mask. And then uh, VSP was eight hours and laser was about uh, two and a third time on hours. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, one, one question, uh, you know, uh, just purely looking at statistics, uh, multi-beam takes 12 hours, VSP takes eight hours. Is, isn't uh, isn't multi-beam supposed to be faster than VSP? Right. Well, I think the I, I think oh, the is we we have to go back to some of what Hayashi San said. What we're writing on multi beam is significantly comp more complex, and we're using some of the uh, enabling features of the multi beam to look at lower sensitivity resists. And uh, I think there's also the point to remember that multi beams are really targeted around a 12 hour print time. Uh, there's a lot of reason that uh, we don't want to exceed a eight or 10 hours on a, on a VSB, whereas 12 hours is sort of the expected print time for a um, multi-beam system. Right, so yeah, if you wrote the same mask that you wrote on a multi-beam on a VSP machine instead, then it would take longer, right? right? We'd need to change the scale on this plot. Right, right, I see this. <laughs> right. Yeah, Hayasan? Yeah, I agree yeah, that, that, about that. So that, uh, um, uh, we are, uh, Several times, see that such kind of uh, very complex features on uh, uh, BSV, it will take more than two days. Sometimes <laughs> we'll take uh, three days, kind of things. So it's uh, above the scale. Yeah. So basically, um, multi beam can write things that it, that wasn't practical for VSP, right? That's uh, that's the situation. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Well, certainly uh, curved linear is uh, uh, one of them, right? Um, okay, uh, let's move on from this question. Um, let's see. So uh, another thing on multi-beam is, uh, this is going back to the luminary survey, right? So multi uh, 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 mask maker survey uh, is about facts going back a year. Uh, the luminary survey is asking luminaries opinions about what people think is going to happen. This one is about uh, luminaries uh, opinions. Um, basically, there is a pretty dominant thought. The multi-V mask writer is going to be the future of leading edge mask writing. But um, let's uh, look uh, at the left side of this chart uh, where we're talking about uh, trading edge technology. Uh, Franklin Koch did a famous talk two years ago at this event um, uh, at the EBM Initiative event at uh, Bacchus. Uh, and uh, he uh, basically said that there is going to be a resurgence of investment in the trading edge nodes uh, because of uh, aging equipment and also uh, uh, because uh, you know trading edge continues to be important. Um, so, uh, but when you look at this uh, response from the luminaries, um, uh, it's not. You wouldn't say it's uh, overwhelmingly positive on the uh, future of laser or trading edge VSP. Um, you know, what, 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 what's, uh, what's happening here, do you think? Anything? Well, I, th I think that, uh, first of all, I'd take a slightly different interpretation to the sort of Franklin Koch effect. Uh, okay. And my interpretation is that he's saying that because of the economics of supporting these older technologies, which still have sort of very significant demand, that uh, we need a new business model within the industry. That frankly, um, where these technologies are currently running on fully amortized tools is the economic model needed to continue to support the demand. And that as an industry, we can't afford to replace those with new tools 
as they age and as they become obsolete. So I think that he was really advocating that we need a new business model in terms of sustaining and uh, and uh, upgrading the, the obsolete tools. But I do think that this, this chart shows some positivity because there has been some answers done by existing and new mask tool manufacturers in terms of creating new equipment to fill those gaps that maybe come in at a different price point, whether it's on e-beam or on laser systems uh, that I think are there to support that demand and non-cutting edge nodes. Uh, so I think that's where the positivity comes in terms of staying the same or, or potential growth in those older nodes. Yeah, thanks. And um, so, you know, we asked the luminaries and, you know, luminaries consist of uh, a large population of different people from the ecostructure uh, around the mask making uh, business. But uh, uh, what does the mask maker think? Hayasan, what do you think about uh, uh, the Franklin Coke effect and uh, what's going to happen to uh, equipment purchases uh, in the laser and trading as VSB. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the mask maker has, uh, uh, yeah, has a uh, issue about the lack of uh, capacity for uh, mostly uh, middle and low end mask set. So that uh, uh, if the advanced node mask we move to the multi beam, then uh, we can use uh, current like advanced PSV tool for such kind of the middle mm. uh, end mask. But still we have a problem in the end of life of a laser writer and the trading edge VSV still. So as Jet said, maybe we need a new player uh, to uh, provide such kind of a tool in this area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, so there's probably a little bit at least of the opportunity, but the uh, cost and other things are important. Franklin noted that too, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so let's uh, move on to uh, EUV. Um, before we go into this slide on EUV pellicle uh, question, uh, 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 this was uh, a luminary survey question. Uh, uh, just in general for EUV pellicles, uh, what's happening? Emily is an uh, expert on this area, so. Um. Yeah, so I mean, in general, um, in terms of the public, um, there is an available solution. So there's a polysilicon based solution that should be commercially available. Um, in, in practice, individuals, um, companies working on this development area, are, it's pretty competitive and there's a lot of activities happening behind the scenes that isn't really shared. Um, mm. The commercially available system is there and some choose to use it, some choose not to. There have been all kinds of different, different implementation schemes very little of which is published. Mm -hmm, okay. Uh, uh, like people who don't use pedicles, uh, those who don't, they're, they're basically cleaning a lot. Is that what's happening? Yeah, that would be the assumption. Oh. <laughs> okay. In, 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 fairness, in fairness, there have been tremendous gains in the cleanliness of the scanner itself and a lot of learning mm -hmm. in terms of how to handle masks and use them. So I think it might be a combination of, of really learning how to be cleaner in manufacturing and also cleaning masks, implementing inspection on wafer. Yeah, so I, th yeah. I think there are a lot of options out there and most of them are being exercised. Okay. Speaking of inspecting on a wafer, um, the next question also from the luminary survey uh, is about that, about well, that and other things, other kinds of inspection of masks. So uh, this is asking, uh, rooted in the actinic inspection question, but also uh, that's the top bar, uh, actinic inspection in the mask shop, and then the uh, second set of bars in the middle are about the multi-beam, uh, e-beam based multi-beam inspection uh, in the mask shop. And the bottom one is what Emily was just talking about, uh, uh, recall uh, use uh, in the wafer shop where uh, multi-beam inspection is used in the wafer shop. Um, on the mask shop questions on the top two, 74% plus 48% is more than 100%. So basically the luminaries are saying, uh, you know, some mask shops are gonna use both or maybe some mask shops use one and other mask shops use another one or, uh, or it's adding up more than 100%. And what, what, what's, how, how do we read this? Um, what, what do you think is happening? Maybe uh, Emily, you can. 
Sure, I can start and others feel free to jump in. But in my mind, actinic inspection, you know, there was a paper by Intel that was presented at SPIE Advanced Litho in February. So mm -hmm. very nice, promising results on uh, LaserTech's actinic system. So it exists, it can be used, but I feel like it's a different space from the E-beam. So obviously it's more sensitive to EUV relevant impact, but then the E-beam multi-beam has its advantages as well. I mean, you get a good sense for visibly what's on the mask. So I feel like they can be complementary, which is why you can have numbers like this that add up to more than 100%. And I think there's room for both. I think there's a room for both and a need for both, depending on, frankly, sort of the integration and application strategy, uh, right? When the mask house is paired very closely to the manufacturing site, that opens up other options uh, than when it's not. This ties in very closely to sort of the pellicle question. And I think why there is such a broad range of answers, both on the pellicle and on the inspection, because there's more than one way to skin this cat. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. All right, thanks. Um, uh, continuing on with uh, EUV, but uh, this one is actually from the mask maker survey. So this is uh, uh, actual usage uh, by the reported companies. And uh, what you see, N equals four, four responding companies um, uh, for EUV question, the uh, yield went up substantially. That, that this could be because the participating companies changed from year to year. Uh, not the same companies responded in any of those three years. So that, it could be because of that. But it could also be that that's what's happening. And uh, uh, Jed, do you have any thoughts about how to interpret that? I think the thing to remember is that as much positive press we see about EUV, right, frankly, it's still in its infancy in terms of deployment into manufacturing. So I think probably what we're seeing here is a different definition of yield. I think on most of the other bars, uh, yield me refers to an all good mask, whereas on the EUV, it's re more referring to a good enough mask for the application that's needed. Now, certainly some of these are being applied to high volume manufacturing and have to meet the same criteria, but uh, for a lot of the other learning and the applications and depending on what the assumptions are about defectivity and again, getting back to the sort of pellicle cleanliness uh, and inspection question, uh, I think that the, the bar might be a little different. So like uh, inherent redundancy in the design, for example, making it more resilient to uh, uh, yield problems, right? That, that, that's the kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, it could be there or simply that a lot of these EUV masks are not necessarily intended for high volume manufacturing, but more they're used for development, right? Um, there's a couple ways that EUV is, is a valuable tool in development as has been discussed previous years, both there's for the fundamental EUV technology development, but also just as an acceleration vehicle where you don't necessarily need to yield 100% of the bits or 100% of the circuits, but you can get the process and the overall integration learning through faster cycles and uh, by getting masks out and shipping them. Um, and especially, right, as we know, the, given the cost of EUV masks, there's a lot of incentive to find use and find value from every mask started. Right, right. So if way through yield expectations are not as high, mask yield definition could change, right? That you said that good enough, right? right. Okay, okay. That's good. That's very insightful. Um, all right, great. Thank you. Um, let's uh, go on to this question um, again about EUV. This is asking the opinions on. Uh, oh no, this is actually, no, sorry. This is about the uh, uh, mask maker survey. Uh, what we asked about uh, uh, what is the uh, uh, reason for uh, not yielding EUV. And uh, a little bit of a surprise, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know anything about it, but uh, I know that in general for all masks, an uh, opaque defect is the majority reason and clear defect is number two reason, but uh, clear defect is 39% here. Um, Hayasan, what do, you, what, what do you make of this one? Yeah, so at, uh, yeah, as you pointed out, for optical mask, we can get uh, zero, uh, like a pinhole defect, Frank, already with uh, the long history of the blank supplier's uh, effort to improve that, and also a uh, uh, relatively uh, simple layer stack. But in the EUV blank, still we are uh, uh, on the way to the so-called uh, perfect mask, so that uh, uh, it will have, uh, it has a very complex layer stacking. 
so that uh, we can see that uh, uh, more pinhole defect still, and also uh, the uh, clear defect repair is a kind of the issue still uh, for the uh, affecting that yield. I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it might be a ratio of things that EUV is being used for too. I guess. Jed, yeah. I was going to say there might be a couple other applications. I think Hayashi san it's a statement about uh, EUV. Um, defect repair yield is very important. Remembering that uh, with this complicated stack, in terms of doing a subtractive repair for opaque absorbers, those you can do fairly high confidence without names, where we're trying to do a clear defect and reconstruct them, uh, the absorber. That's a lot more complicated a situation, especially given the multi-layer. So Ames is more critical there, so there may be more caution. But one other factor that needs to be considered as we tie back to the multi-beam discussion um, from the beginning, is for UV, we tend to use thinner resists uh, to get increased resolution, which does make things more susceptible to breakthrough and pinhole defects that might also lead to the higher incidence of clear defects. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, let's uh, uh, talk about the uh, resist, because uh, uh, this is actually also coming from the mask maker survey, and the historical trend is what's interesting. Uh, again, the participating companies were different, so we need to be cautious about that. But uh, despite the participating companies being different, uh, for 193i, the median of the highest dose resist used uh, remained the same, um, whereas on the EUV side, uh, it's like not quite half, but uh, dropped quite a bit. Um, uh, uh, Hayasan, again, do you, do you think you have an explanation for this? Is this anomaly, trend? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's uh, the simply the uh, resist uh, sensitivity was improved with the uh, same very good performances, uh, especially for maybe other chemical amplified resist. So you can see the maximum, you know, dose 240 is same. So uh, still the some uh, area is used with uh, uh, like a non-chemical amplifier resist kind of things. It's a trial base maybe, but the chemical amplifier resist sensitivity is, uh, uh, as you can see that uh, drastically improved with uh, good performance, I think. Oh, so fundamental improvement. Yeah, Emily? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, I find this interesting because on the wafer side, with, with looking at the same sort of trend, we've been very flat for dose at a, a higher level, at a high level because of stochastics. Nobody, even if there are improvements, we can't take advantage of them because of trying to solve stochastic defects. But it means that here on the mask, we're not yet in the same regime, which is a positive thing. Or I would say that uh, alternatively, it goes into sort of my previous statement about yield and these masks being good enough. Given the, I think that uh, at the in initial introduction of EUV, when we were first working on it, we were very aggressive about trying to drive down all the sources of variation. I think Emily, as you sort of referred to, we're, we're fighting stochastics now that's sort of setting a floor level for things like LER that we're able to achieve at this point. Uh, so I think in a lot of ways, we're, there, there are places where we've learned that it's worth applying the, uh, the, the better fidelity processes, maybe using the lower sense, higher sensitivity resists, or lower sensitivity resists, and in others, we can use a lower sensitive re resist and uh, regain some of the throughput without um, costing the performance on wafer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, all right, so a totally different uh, subject here on EUV included. Um, curvilinear shapes uh, is the question. Uh, we, for the first time in a luminary survey this year, we asked about uh, what they thought about uh, curvilinear shapes because all of a sudden there's a lot of discussion about it, uh, including about curvilinear format and a whole bunch of stuff. So um, we thought we asked to see where they are. Um, uh, really much to my surprise, um, uh, the you know overwhelmingly positive um, uh, thoughts even for EUV, um, uh, you know because D2S is doing uh, curvilinear stuff. Uh, it, it's uh, this is great from our perspective, but uh, it, it it seems like it seems almost like too good. Like you know how can it change from like zero now pretty much right <laughs> to, to this much in 2023. I don't know. Uh, what, 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 what do you think, uh, Jed? Do you want to start? Uh, well, I agree. This is sort of more aggressive deployment of curvilinear than I would expect as well, especially the uh, the 12% that's referring to entire reticles of curvilinear shapes. 
Um, frankly, I think that there's largely not a need for that. The curve of linear benefit is undeniably that it's been simulated and it's been demonstrated. Uh, but the fact is that most mass, most shapes on a mask don't need it. Um, we've optimized the elimination. We've optimized the ground rules to be very supportable without curvilinear shapes. There are some levels and some technologies that, re that require it. And those um, really get focused on with hotspot repair. So I, I support the, um, the green in terms of being mostly Manhattan with some curvilinear shapes. I think that that's going to get broader and broader application. And I also think that uh, for the companies that are not yet using multi-beam, uh, that's acceptable in terms of the right time impact on the vector shape beam systems. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, Emily, you want to go? Yeah. Yeah, so I think I think that hotspot repair is definitely one place of interest. I, I guess I also support, you know, some amount of green in the future. I also wonder whether it couldn't be the SRAF implementation, just because there is a place where having some flexibility on the shape and placement would be really useful. And curvilinear would be a good application for that. So, I see so you mean not for the main features, but for curvilinear for the SRAFs, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, okay, interesting. What about the, the readiness in the mask shop, um, Hayasan? Yeah, uh, for the mask shop standpoint, I think it's uh, maybe a too optimistic. <laughs> 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 yeah, we have um, now the multi-beam mask writer, so the, maybe uh, the mask writing is uh, uh, okay. But still, we have uh, many issues in the uh, methodology area, especially uh, how to measure the curvilinear feature or how to inspect and even how to prepare kind of things. Still, uh, we should see uh, such kind of uh, you know, issues uh, to implement the curvilinear features in uh, everywhere kind of things. But you're, you're unique to have a multi-beam capability to write it. So, so faster this happens, better it is for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, uh, good. Uh, so um, EUV, though, um, I, I have a question. Um, you know, 183i, we know that there's a struggle and, and uh, uh, you know, you, you want to uh, try to get the best way for quality possible. Um, but, uh, you know, EUV, uh, you know, 13.5 nanometer instead of 193 is, uh, you know, even though it's I, right? So it's a little less ineffective, but still, like, there's a huge difference, isn't there? It's like, isn't, like why, does, why does the, why do the luminaries think that EUV masks also are going to go curvilinear? Jed, do you have any insight? Sure. I mean, I think, first of all, the resolution isn't just uh, the 193i divided by 13 and a half, right? There's a lot of factors in there. Um, but I think, I think there's several key components. The first is, as Emily has referred to, with the complexity of the illumination uh, for EUV to really sort of gain the benefit of SRAFs. Um, we need the flexibility for really fine placement, and that includes, frankly, curvilinear placement. They can't be put at a set distance away from the primary feature. But I think another, um, another sort of key factor is that uh, there's already sort of significant computational investment required for EUV to do the OPC and to deal with the um, axial asymmetric um, illumination. So the computational investment that's already planned is very high. And so I think that it's a relatively small additional investment with the multi-beam systems being able to support them. Uh, it's sort of uh, gambling the best for success because we need those companies that are exercising it need EUV to succeed. Uh, frankly, I think that the extra risk of implementing curvilinear solution on EUV when we're already running with multi-beam, already running significant computational investment is very small and the potential benefit is significant. Mm, yeah, yeah. So the reflective nature of EUV uh, contributes some to the need side of it. And then, um, uh, like, you know, if we already know how to do it for 193i, why not use it for EUV, kind of, right? Yeah. Especially if we've already got a multi-beam. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, so that goes back to the earlier discussion about uh, how uh, EUV uh, goes, speaks to the need for multi-beam. And, uh, uh, you know, you were saying earlier that uh, that's the primary reason why you get one. But once you get one, you can use it for many things, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, 
So uh, this is a question uh, in the mask maker survey. I'm looking back one year for what the responding companies actually did. Um, it's about turnaround time, and uh, this one actually requires a little explanation. Um, in all the years that we've been reporting this, this is the first time that uh, 7 to 11, the leading edge, the, the rightmost dot, uh, went down from the previous years, right? Uh, this is asking about how long does it take uh, to get a mask from uh, basically RET out um, all the way to uh, getting the mask out, right? So, um, uh, like, how could it speed up in a leading edge? That's, that's a, it, it's kind of a mysterious input. And so because um, we were surprised, um, we asked to uh, do a different analysis of the same data, uh, which is plotted on the right. Uh, it's a normalized average, which basically is an indication uh, of if you asked any given mask shop, what's this plot look like? We can't show that to people, right? Because that's individual companies' data. But then if we just averaged all of those, um, what would it look like? And it does go up and to the right. So um, it probably is the case, we, we don't know for sure, but uh, a likely explanation of the combination of these two plots is that um, uh, the, the reason it's going down to 7.53 for 7 to 11 is that the five companies here that responded to 7 to 11 tends to be better at that overall for all nodes um, compared to companies who don't have uh, capability to do 7 to 11. And that kind of makes sense because uh, companies who have to do the leading edge probably have more resources overall in people, computing power, machines, you know, like, like pretty, much, pretty much everything, right? So um, that, that might be what's happening. Um, I, uh, I, do you have any comment, uh, any additional insight or any uh, alternative explanations or um, anybody? Jed, anything? Um, I guess uh, the plot on the right speaks to my expectation. I think on average, right, it's sort of undeniable that the uh, more advanced nodes are going to be more difficult. Even uh, when we get to EUV or, uh, or, sorry, even when we do non-EUV solutions and do multi-patterning, yes, there's more masks, but they're equivalently complicated masks. Uh, so I, I am surprised by the plot on the left. I'm not surprised by the plot on the right. I think that meets, the, meet, meets my expectation. Uh, I'll again tie back to some of my earlier comments that could explain the 7.53, uh, simply being that perhaps some of these masks meet the good enough yield as opposed to a, the mm. all good criteria for yield. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it could be the same kind of an effect. But then again, it's, you know, like because um, past year's versions of this plot all had it up and to the right, even in just the weighted average, we, we never had to do the normalized average okay. plot. Um, so it's, it's something is different this year. Well, I think that speaks to no matter what, the significant amount of learning and the investment that's going on in those 7 mm -hmm. to 11 and the, com and the complex technology. Certainly, uh, mask cycle times that were previously above 15, I think, for previous years, if I remember, those are, those are not really uh, viable for supporting um, the, the wafer movement and the uh, schedule needed uh, for mask delivery. Mm -hmm. Emily, any thoughts on this? Um, no, I mean, we, we, one possible explanation, but it's not borne out when you have the chart on the right. But I do think that for some cases, when you split into multiple layers, if you have a single really complex layer, and then you take it and you make a much a simpler cut layer with a line space layer, for example. I think those individual masks are going to be easier than the combined one. The OPC a little bit less complex and that you could see a little bit of a reduction in some of the turnaround times. Um, but yeah, that, that would be a good explanation for the year to year difference. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, interesting. So uh, yeah, well, we can't wait to see what happens next year and see um, if the trend is continuing or otherwise or whatever. So uh, a reason to be uh, excited to wait for next year. Um, all right, so let's uh, 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 close or nearly close with a question about deep learning that we asked the luminaries. Um, uh, we were asking, uh, you know, do you think it's gonna, deep learning is gonna uh, appear anywhere uh, in the mask making process, um, you know, in, in any step anywhere? And uh, uh, the, the, these are the answers that we received. Um, uh, you know, so uh, more than half think yes in the next couple of years, 
but almost half, uh, maybe I guess a third, uh, think uh, it's going to take a while, and some people even think never, right? Uh, uh, and, and, and any thoughts on Hayasan, you're in the mask shop, um, like, what, what do you think about deep learning? Yeah, so uh, uh, actually, uh, we are mask shop is now uh, hardly working on uh, so-called uh, digital transformation. So uh, to improve the, you know, the productivity in our line. Mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, we applied so-called, yeah, very broad meaning of the AI technologies uh, and investing uh, uh, so much uh, in this area now. So maybe uh, another two, two, three years, we can get uh, the good, you know, uh, improvement result with such kind of the technology, we hope. Oh, so DMP is investing in AI technologies itself, right. not, just, not just that the vendors might be doing it, um, you're doing it yourself. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's good. Yeah, AI and deep learning and machine learning, there's lots of different terminologies floating around that. Yeah. All right. Okay, great. Oh, that's, uh, that, that's exciting. That's, that's a good thing. Um, okay, so uh, we are at the end of the uh, survey slides here, but um, uh, uh, just a final poll from uh, these three luminaries on uh, what, what, what do you think about uh, um, mask making opportunity going forward? Are you uh, uh, thinking positively? Uh, you think it's, uh, you know, we're kind of in trouble? You think it's about the same? It's so-so? Um, what, what do you think? I, I think it's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I agree. I agree. <laughs> There's lots uh, of opportunities out there. There's always lots of problems that need to be fixed. And uh, we, we fuel, as I said, we fuel the uh, semiconductor industry. Yeah, lots of demand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's just, you know, incredible time now with uh, EUV, multi-beam, and I, I, I just think it's so so full of opportunities. And even just analyzing these, uh, these slides and thinking about it, um, like, you know, there's lots of mysteries, right? It's not like we understand it all. Right, and there are all these technologies that we've been hearing about on the edge for a long time that are now actually being used, and we get to learn from them and take advantage of them, and that's that's exciting. Yeah, 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 it is. All right, well, thank you very much. And um, I know so little about some of these subjects. I know uh, I know some of them well, but uh, you know, this is such a broad uh, field, right? And you know, you you have to be Leonardo da Vinci to understand all this stuff. So. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate all of your help to uh, uh, shed light and expertise onto uh, uh, all of these diverse areas that all have to come together to make this all happen. So, yeah, thank you very much. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Stay healthy, stay well. Yes.